welcome to a short in between episodes episode. The reason I'm releasing this now is there was a draft paper released recently titled The Fomi Paradox and the Aurora Effect, Exo-Civilization Settlement, Expansion, and Steady States, and it started getting discussed and I had several requests to do a video explaining it, so I thought we'd go through it and then get into some of the pros and cons for the theory. Let's start with the title. If you're watching this episode, odds are you already know what the Fermi Paradox is, which is the apparent contradiction between how empty of life the Universe appears to be and just how huge, ancient, and filled with potentially habitable planets it is, or basically, where are all the alien civilizations? But the Aurora Effect is probably unfamiliar unless you've read Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson, author of the Mars Trilogy. We'll use the definition from the paper that good worlds are hard to find, which is to say, just because you might find a planet you could settle and terraform doesn't mean it's really one you'd invest effort into, or for that matter be able to transplant a civilization there that could successfully grow. History is full of settlements that failed or stalled out after all. Let me start by saying that I have issues with the theory, which I'll expand on once I've laid out what that theory is. So let's first go through the paper in a more relatable way so we understand what it is all about. If you assume that most systems don't have a place anyone wants to live or will thrive at, it really puts a dent in the classic expansion model for the galaxy. That assumes you colonize in a forced way from Earth, our solar system anyway, and then those colonies colonize those near them eventually, who do the same. This is a very common approach for modeling galactic settlement timelines, and we often refer to it as percolation because you can then model it like a fluid going through some porous substance. How many worlds are viable for settlement, and how quickly those settlements grow to be willing and able to dispatch a dot or colony of their own, rinse and repeat. Models based on this are very sensitive to a number of variables, and can thus produce a wide range of galactic colonization timelines. For instance, if our colonists can and want to settle every star system, can travel at 1% of light speed, and we assume the typical colony begins with 10,000 people, doubles in numbers every 50 years like we did in the 20th century, and will colonize a new system when they get to 10 billion people, they need to double 20 times to go from 10,000 to 10 billion and it will take them just a millennia after settlement to get to colonizing their own new systems. Just to keep the math easy, if they only travel at 1% light speed and only settle within 10 light years, it takes them another millennium to get a colony ship to all those systems in range, so basically your colonization wave percolates out at 10 light years per every 2000 years. It means you colonize at 0.5% of light speed, you travel at 1% but spend half of your time stopped and growing in numbers. Galactic colonization, everything within 100,000 light years, would take 20 million years. That sounds like a long time, but to put that in perspective, a single rotation of our galaxy takes roughly a quarter of a billion years, so this 20 million year timeline means not much in our galaxy has changed. At the local level, a score of centuries won't rearrange the locations of neighboring stars much either, so we treat the galaxy as basically static. In other words, the stellar motion can be ignored for colonization. However, you can play with those numbers a lot, or even outright discard the model when using something like our garden or ship approach. If your ships can move at a modest fraction of light speed, say 10%, then most of the percolation time is growing your numbers on each new planet, and you can advance from each one a lot further for each step, since they can now haul colonial ships much faster and further each time. You might make steps of 100 light years every two millennia, colonize at 5% light speed, and settle the whole galaxy in just 2 million years. You're also way less likely to stall out on any given front because you've got such a large range, encompassing so many settled worlds, that if some don't grow quick and send out colonies, many others are plugging that gap, like broadcasting lawn seeds. On the flip side of this, if you have to go slower, or if many worlds just aren't desirable for colonization, or if they grow much slower or tend to lose a desire for colonization and don't send out ships once they can, 
then you percolate far slower and might even stall out completely. If we were assuming it takes 100,000 years to grow enough to make each new jump and it was 10 light years a jump, you're creeping outward from Earth at just a percent of a percent of light speed and will need a billion years to colonize the galaxy, during which time you can basically discard the notion that humanity is even doing this, as your civilizations are diverging massively at each step so that even your nearest neighbors or mother world are basically different species and you might argue about who colonizes what, since there's not likely to be much team spirit even in your local expansion area. This is even more hindered if you can't expect to find a suitable candidate in 10 light years of you. If you can only make a successful colony around maybe 1 in 100 stars similar enough to our own, and only maybe 1 in 100 of those has a planet that's a desirable candidate for terraforming, you are only going to have a couple candidates within 100 light years of you not the many thousands we normally assume when discussing this topic here on SFIA. If your ships aren't relativistic, and you're focused on terraforming planets, that's a real long voyage to ask folks to make for the honor of living on desolate wastelands for the many millennia it would take to terraform them properly, and it is the basic reasoning behind the classic sci-fi space opera of galactic empires with only a few million inhabited worlds. That colonization process is very slow, and very hard, and very disorganized, and can peter out as colonies fail, or just barely prosper and are not interested in repeating the Herculean task of colonizing again themselves. It also implies you might have dead colonies, ones that just failed and then went extinct, and timelines long enough that even if an older alien one did so on a world we came across, we might not even know they had. That's also a popular notion in sci-fi, that great civilizations arise and eventually end, leaving little or nothing behind in their wake when a new civilization evolves and sends out its sons and daughters to do as they did before us. On such timelines, you really can't treat the galaxy as a static place either. Not only might a civilization that once looked like a vaguely spherical blob have smeared itself across the galaxy as all the stars moved around, but they might actually be taking advantage of local stellar motion for colonization. If you are going the slow boat route of colonization, taking many centuries to prepare for missions that might not move much faster than our modern space probes, you might bypass nearer stars in favor of ones moving towards you. So the paper lists a number of parameters and assigns various values to them. Those values we need not consider, they weren't chosen out of a hat, but still are fairly arbitrary, even if reasonable guesses, and like Drake's equation, when you've got a lot of parameters, many of which you can't nail down to even an order of magnitude, you can't draw many concrete conclusions from them. We are not going to walk through their math, though it is an interesting model. Some of those parameters are the fraction of systems that are settleable, the density of systems, which is not uniform, some regions of space will be near wastelands while others will be much closer and richer in worlds than our own region. We've also got probe or ship range, and velocity, as those both are major factors in not just how far and fast you can go, but how many candidate worlds you have access to and if you're even willing to do it. Others include probe or ship build and launch times, lifetimes of the settlement, average stellar motion if you're going slow enough you need to factor that in, and many more. This includes the notion that if settlements are dying off, folks would have to resettle them to continue expanding. Now this gets back to the Fermi Paradox more directly by reminding us of Michael Hart's Fact A in his original conjecture about the Fermi Paradox which is sometimes called the Fermi Hart Paradox because Hart is basically the guy who began the discussion of the Fermi Paradox. Fact A is that there are no aliens currently on Earth. Obviously not everyone agrees with that, but it's the basis of discussion for the paradox, since there's obviously no paradox about where all the aliens are if the answer is out in a farm field crushing corn stalks to make modern art. I also usually don't like calling that a fact, as a lack of evidence to me is more of an assumption than a fact. I've never seen leprechauns, don't believe they exist, but I'm hesitant to say, fact, leprechauns are not on Earth. Whichever, it is the basic assumption of the Fermi Paradox, 
along with the idea that while Earth and its life might be fairly special, it's probably not so special we wouldn't expect lots of other places where life can pop up and get a foothold and potentially be spawning other civilizations that might be interested in colonizing new worlds too. But there's a second half of that, because while it says there are no aliens currently on Earth, it also implies none in the past too. By fossils and genetics we can rule out us being an alien colony that got abandoned, unless it either happened a few billion years ago, since we can see a clear relation to other life on Earth and a common origin, or that they took more of a bioforming route and basically adapted themselves into our existing world very subtly. Which is possible, but tends to involve a lot of weird choices and hand waves to make much sense without ramming into the fossil record. That brings us to an outright failed colony, one that just didn't take off and was being done to minimize disruption to the local and current life, and could maybe escape notice in the fossil record. Just to throw one out there for daydreaming, if some aliens came here 65 million years ago and settled near Yucatan, they might have domed things over at their base to avoid too much back and forth ecological leakage while they were setting up, and since they and their own life would probably not match well for existing conditions. That's something we'd do, even if we meant to totally replace the ecosystem already on a world we'd want to study it in detail first and keep ourselves isolated. If after a few centuries things just weren't working out, we weren't growing much, and many of those born since were fond of the existing ecosystem and didn't want destroyed, I could see them abandoning the colony or setting the reactor to blow up and vaporize all the extraterrestrial life, leaving behind a big crater. This would effectively erase most of the evidence they were here, and time would do a good job removing the rest. This is an example of how you can decouple Hart's Fact A, No Aliens Here Now, from no aliens here ever. So the paper argues there's an effective temporal horizon that would obscure our ability to see previous visitors or settlements. See the Cyclic Apocalypses episode though for why this normally won't tend to work for expecting time to erase signs of prior civilizations. Or short form, bones aren't the only things that fossilize or otherwise leave a long term remnant and civilizations would tend to leave a ton of mysterious right angles in their geological records. The caveat here is you must have been a fairly large civilization to leave enough of those kind of footprints that we'd be likely to have some survive and numerous enough we'd find them. So this is the basic notion, civilizations arise probably not too often, don't find too much to colonize, take a very long time to do it, and often have local pockets grind to a halt or die off. When new civilizations arise, the time between these civilizations and their smaller scope means you could easily not even see them if they had a colony next door at some point, or maybe even on your own planet. We'll mostly bypass the paper's discussion of stellar motions because I think that overdoes things. If you are already assuming colonization so slow that each colonization front is incorporating the motion of stars and the galaxy not being static into their plans, I would think you could just assume they will throw their hands up in the air and not colonize just because of the time needed. Whether you're doing it by slow boat generation ships or probes that arrive and unpack and replicate and build a civilization, time remains a hurdle that many are not going to want to try jumping over especially if that's such a long time that whatever is doing the colonization isn't going to even vaguely resemble what their mother system has mutated into or the original colonists who left. Hard to get dinosaurs to colonize the galaxy if they know it will be the humans who actually arrive, essentially. Alright, that brings us to the question, what's the flaw in the paper's reasoning? Channel regulars are probably raising an eyebrow with me at that good worlds are hard to find aspect, asking why you even care about finding good worlds since we normally wouldn't even expect spacefaring civilizations to much care about planets. To quote my friend Fraser Kane, gravity wells are for suckers. You've just gone to all that effort to escape your own planet's gravity well, why would you go set up shop on another one? 
So when we talk about colonizing other star systems, we usually emphasize that you start not by landing on a planet there, but by linking up to various resource-rich, low-gravity objects like asteroids and moons, build rotating habits there if you want or need gravity, and settle planets if you want to, but only after you've set up your basic space-based industry and infrastructure. Planets may or may not have their value, and might end up very prized by civilizations as potential centers, but in their own right are no bottleneck to expansion. If we assume that approach, it pretty much ends the theory under discussion today right there. Interstellar colonization is mostly done by civilizations that back home already mostly don't live on planets, as they build and breed their way up to K2 civilization status, and while Earth-like planets might be highly valued, or not, most folks live in artificial habitats already, they've lived on one for the long trip to the new system, and ought to be happy enough in one at the destination or even prefer those over spending centuries to terraform a planet. Such being the case, virtually every star and planet, habitable or not, becomes prime real estate, because to you they are really just an electric outlet and building supply shop. But even if those systems are more valued, as they may well be, you will tend to backfill as you go, same as settlers always claim the best spots first, and fill in over time. So let's get into the meat of my objection. This concept is very dependent on the notion that colonists are likely to be either limited or picky about what systems they settle, and might tend to fail even then. That's a perfectly reasonable assumption inside the usual space opera context of just settling Earth-like planets, but even ignoring the notion that we are likely to build most of the places we live in, not terraform them, we are not going to make our first colonized world around another star. We try for Mars or Venus first, and either we'd find out that's not practical, and either stay at home or go the artificial habitats route, or for a more cybernetic or digital existence, or we'd have gotten practice making places like Venus and Mars habitable, in which case, we already know how to do it and if we can do them, then Earth-like gets very unimportant. Worlds of similar mass and temperature to Earth might not be too common, but if we widen the range to include wretched miserable rocks like Mars and Venus, then odds are you won't ever have to look far for a star that's a good candidate, and you also have a couple planets whose inhabitants won't find them unappealing and can supply colonists. Even if you expand the habitable world definition to be safe, amenable star systems, without exposure to dangerous stellar events like supernovae, pulsars, and quasars, the time horizons and backfilling of systems from continued growth will just leave gaps in your galaxy's colonization, not roadblocks. The second flaw is that it probably won't be a process of planet hopping anyway, even if planets are preferable, especially to folks who live on them, A future population of this solar system is likely to mostly be people who weren't born on a planet and live inside a great big cylinder, or on a computer chip, and neither of those cares much about either travel times or destination planets, just so long as the destination has free matter and energy to exploit. The former already live on a spaceship, since a rotating habitat is a spaceship, and the latter can literally just send copies of themselves. Remember, we all suffer from confirmation bias, the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms one's pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. We all currently live on a planet, so our bias is to naturally think that planets are good things to live on and in the future our descendants will continue with that trend. However, that's dangerous thinking because if we asked a farmer a couple centuries back whether the majority of the world's population would live in cities in the future, they would have laughed at us. They would have rightly argued that the majority of folks live as farmers and if everyone moved to towns or cities there wouldn't be enough farmers to feed all the city dwellers. Now we know from our history that the farmer was ultimately wrong, 
mechanization and technology revolutionized farming and today the majority of folks now live in urban environments. We have to be careful not to apply the same confirmation bias to the notion that humanity will always want to live on planets too. By the time we are ready to aim for galactic colonization, we will be a K2 civilization or moving toward that. Our solar system will be peppered with thousands or millions of space habitats, possibly far more, and the majority of humanity will not have set foot on a planet let alone lived on one. They won't be wedded to the notion that planets need to be colonized any more than we are wedded to the notion that most of us need to be farmers. Another objection is just this general notion that civilizations can go extinct. They don't. They can collapse and we've tons of examples, but they don't just die off without external pressures, usually a rival civilization eroding them, even more so when they are high tech and thus resilient to things like natural disasters. Collapse is not synonymous with extinction then, it's just an alteration, usually to something tougher and stronger except for when discussed by a historian who had a crush on the civilization under discussion and dislikes the barbarians who ended them. I don't usually like to broaden the term evolution to include social aspects, but it's valid on longer timelines and particularly in this case. Applying the survival of the fittest litmus tests to a large sample size, you should generally expect civilizations over time to get better, not worse, at surviving. You can argue that evolution, which generally breeds to make things tougher and more adapted to their area, does not apply to high-tech civilizations, but it basically does not because through forethought, planning, and strategy we can do better than random odds, which again kind of negates the notion that such civilizations will dwindle on new worlds when they're drawing on centuries of planning and prior experience and know what challenges await them. And even if we accept the idea that a combination of slow colonization, a low fraction of settled worlds of stars available, and modest long-term success rates for colonies would create silent bubbles in our galaxy, that won't necessarily solve the Fermi Paradox. It will strongly depend on the visibility of civilizations. Even if Earth is in the middle of a thousand light year bubble of space that's not settled yet, or not anymore, the closest Dyson Swarm or Space Beacon may still be visible, especially as the folks living there know they are not alone and not hidden since their launch would have been a big and recorded event, thus have every reason to be heard and none to hide, and we see none. Or short form, it's a good theory for the more classic notions of planet colonization, but like a lot of Fermi Paradox approaches for intelligent life being reasonably common, it's leading too heavily on classic notions of settling new places. What we tend to expect is our own system boasting many trillions of people living in space habitats that aren't too interested in living on or colonizing planets. If you're curious about some of the solutions we've discussed for that, check out our Generation Ship series or Outward Bound series, and if you want to know more about other solutions for the Fermi Paradox or the problems with them, try our Fermi Paradox series. And of course, all of those, along with this paper, focus on the idea that while our technology will improve, it probably won't get a lot of neater advantages often seen in science fiction that tend to violate the speed of light or the laws of thermodynamics. This upcoming Thursday we'll relax about that a bit and contemplate some of those more hypothetical technologies so advanced they are indistinguishable from magic and what their implications would be for the civilizations that wield them in Clock Tech. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. You can also support the channel on Patreon. Until next time, thanks for watching, and we'll see you Thursday.